Welcome to Bull TV. I'm your host, David Pickler. Bull TV is a monthly show that empowers, educates, and entertains while highlighting the citizens of Cogerville who inspire and deliver solutions for a stronger community. Bull TV is presented by Pickler Companies and proudly produced by the students of Cogerville High School. We invite you to watch our show at www.bulltv.show, thebullnetwork.com, and chstv19. New episodes air every second Sunday of every month at 3 p.m. Central Time. On today's show, I am joined by two special guests, Cassie Lynn Foote and Dave Rylander, both of whom serve with Collierville Partners in Education, or PI. Today we'll be discussing workforce development in our town and why it's so significant. We'll talk about how PI, with the support of the American Public Education Foundation, is paving the way for students at Collierville High School to succeed beyond the classroom. Stay tuned for this look at what workforce development is, how this once stigmatized area is unlocking incredible potential for our students, and why it's so important for PI to align with businesses in our great community. Today I'm joined by Cassie Lindfoot and Dave Rylander. Cassie, a native Tennessean, is the Assistant Executive Director for the American Public Education Foundation and Executive Director for Collierville Partners in Education. Prior to joining both nonprofits a year and a half ago, Cassie was the Director of Operations and Workforce Development for the Tennessee Business Roundtable in Nashville an organization of senior level business leaders that seeks to collaborate with state government and Tennessee's business organizations to develop and implement policy, supporting business and economic growth in Tennessee. Cassie lives in Collierville with her husband, son, and daughter. Dave serves as board chair for Collierville Partners in Education. He has lived in Collierville for 22 years with his wife, Tony, and three sons. Dave retired from Monsanto in 2016 after nearly 40 years where he held leadership positions in sales and marketing. Dave is heavily involved in his community where he serves as president of Collierville Rotary, chairman of the Collierville Park Advisory Board, and board member of Collierville Education Foundation. Cassie and Dave, thank you both for joining us for this edition of Bull TV. It's a pleasure to be here. Glad to have you. We always try to begin by getting to know our, our guests a little bit. So we have a first question. So I'll go, with, go with, with you, Cassie. Ladies first. In three words, who is Cassie Foote? Well, um, as you mentioned, I have a newly minted one and three-year-old. So I think the first word I would say is tired, um, <laughs> but, but good. Um, I would say that I'm a lifelong learner. That's more than one word, but um, I find a we'll lot give of you a pass. thank you. I find a lot of joy in continuing to to learn and grow um, as I get older. And uh, lastly, connected with Pi, I guess I would say that um, I'm a connector. I uh, I love solving people's problems, but if I can't, um, I like to think that I know someone who can and am able to connect people to make sure that they um, get all their needs met. There's three great words. I like that. Uh, Dave, up to you. Three In words. three words, who is Dave Rylander? So I would say that uh, I'm a big dreamer. Uh, so I dream outside the box. And because of that, I'm an innovator uh, through creativity of coming up with solutions that have not been thought about. And then the final thing I would say is service. I believe in service above self. And so that's why I'm doing a lot of things I'm doing today is to give back to the community. Cassie, I know that you're relatively new to Collierville, 
Uh, but Dave, as we've indicated, you've lived in Collierville and worked in Collierville for many years. Can you tell us a little bit more about the roles that you played with Monsanto before you retired? I'm glad to talk about that. So um, I've worked for Monsanto for 40 years. Uh, Monsanto, most people know Monsanto today as you use Roundup herbicide in your yard or uh, there's all the debate about GMOs and Monsanto was the one that created biotechnology crops that reduce pesticides in the environment. And so back in 1996, when Monsanto was getting ready to launch these products, they said, we need an office in Memphis because that's the center of agriculture in the South. And Dave, you're moving to Memphis. And so that's, that's what I did. And so I was involved with the launch of most of Monsanto's biotech products from 1996 to roughly 2012. And it was a great experience. Uh, got to travel around the world and share learnings with farmers who are not like farmers here in the U.S. So it was a great experience. The thing I, I find most fascinating about what you just said is the whole idea of thinking about farming, about agriculture as a technology. Yep. And, uh, and I know in working with you, uh, we've all learned an awful lot about, uh, about really the future of agriculture and really how Monsanto helped pave the way to that future. And, I th and so Monsanto doesn't exist anymore. They were bought by Bayer in 2016. And I think most people today reflect back on the days of Monsanto, because I mean, we were, being an innovator, you always make mistakes. But we were always innovating. We'd make mistakes, learn from those mistakes, and make it better. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, one of the things that Monsanto was, did was uh, we listened to the needs of the customer, which are so critical in developing products. And I was proud to be part of that. So uh, Cassie, tell us a little bit about Collierville Partners in Education. Well, Collierville Partners in Education uh, started back in 2016. Um, like you said, I've only moved back about a year and a half ago, so I was not uh, there at the time, but uh, it started within um, the Collierville Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the first goals was to help get uh, the high school built. Uh, we wanted a world-class high school, high school for Collierville, so uh, the business community came together and uh, raised, I think, almost $2 million. You were part of that, I believe. Indeed. Um, so they wanted to get these facilities built. I know you were a, you know, one of the founding members of PI. So tell me a little bit about you know, your recollection of really the driving motivation that created the Partners in Education. Yeah, one of the driving motivations was uh, you're going to build a hot, nice high school, but how do you enhance that high school? And so <clears throat> what PI did was we reached out to business partners and we said, look, uh, there are certain things that would make this great high school even greater if we had support from businesses. And so whether it's the Pickler Auditorium or whether it's uh, Lander Sports Center, there was, those are just two examples, but that's how local businesses stepped up to help enhance the high school, which has made the school that we have today the best in the state of Tennessee. But now that CHS has been built, then what do we see as the role today for Collierville Partners in Education? I'd be glad to talk about that because I think it's uh, we're in the next phase now. Uh, and I'm going to relate this back to my career. Uh, I used to go to scientists and engineers and ask them, uh, tell me about your product. And they would tell me, and I says, have you talked to a customer to find out if your product fits his needs? And most of the times, scientists or engineers said they hadn't. And I says, well, so how do you know your product you're creating is going to be used? And I'd also talk to customers, and I'd ask customers, have you shared what your needs are with an engineer or a scientist? Not just today's needs, but five years from now, because otherwise they'll never create the product for you. Mm -hmm. And so as I think about Pi today and moving forward, what, our, uh, what we need to do is we need to connect the businesses who are the customers with the scientists who are the teachers that are creating these products and make sure that the product that they're creating fits the future needs of these businesses or the customer. And I think that's, that's where uh, Pi's next step is, is we've got to create a better workforce. And it's about listening to businesses and connecting them with the school system. Cassie, anything you'd like to add to that? Just that I think, as Dave said, we have this amazing high school now. I think the goal was to build a world-class high school, and we managed to do that. And now Pi wants to come in and work with the high school and the teachers and administration and build a world-class workforce. I'm so glad that you, that you use that word workforce, because there's a lot of, of jargon out there. And sometimes people don't really know exactly 
what that means and how it's really is, is relevant, mm -hmm. as applicable. So what is workforce development and why is it so important? Why are we all talking about mm -hmm. this concept? Well, I think if you're a company, obviously when you're looking to move to an area, you need to know that there's a workforce that's educated and ready to come and work for you. Mm -hmm. And in thinking about who we want to bring to Collierville, that's one of the main focuses. And workforce doesn't start after you graduate college, right? That starts when you are younger and you ask a child, you know, what, what do you want to be when you grow up? You hear, I want to be a fireman, I want to be a doctor, or I want to be a policeman. And that's because these are the folks they see from day to day. And these are the jobs that they see and the job roles that they see. And you don't hear many saying, I want to be a forensic accountant, because they don't know what that is. They don't see that kind of thing. But they may be very qualified to do that as they grow. And uh, so I think it really starts early on um, in you know, sixth, seventh, eighth grade with career awareness and learning about all these opportunities that they may not know about through high school with the great programs at CTE that we have here um, at Collierville High School, throughout two-year, four-year programs, or even graduating high school and going right to the workforce having those people who are aware of what they want to do, mm -hmm. they're skilled, they're ready, they have industry certifications, are, and are prepared to go right into the workforce. Um, it's hugely important to the, the town, economic development, everything. Dave, any thoughts for, for, from a, as a businessman, you know, of the impact of workforce development? So I think workforce development uh, is critical because what it, you see today, a lot of companies moving to where their talent is at okay, and so if we can create a uh, a, a greater workforce here in Collierville, you'll it will help attract businesses into Collierville, which is good for the town of Collierville, and it'll keep Collierville still growing. And so I think uh, that's a critical part of it is um, companies moving to where there is talent. And then I think the other on the other side of that, uh, if I'm a company, I want to go to where there's a good educational system because mm -hmm. that keeps my employees happy. So from a standpoint of you wouldn't want to be located in a place where the school systems are bad because people would say, look, I'm not going to work for you. I'm going to go work for somebody else in a better city someplace. So I, I think there, there's two phases there that I think uh, benefit the town of Collierville if we can get this workforce developed by listening to the businesses and helping mentor the instructors. You know, last month on our Bull TV, we had John Duncan here. And of course, John is the director of economic development for right. Carville, and he was talking a lot about the types of businesses that we're trying to recruit to Carville, the types of, of corporate headquarters we're trying to recruit here. And what I'm hearing you say is that there is a really a significant alignment between workforce development and economic development for Carville. With that, could you expand on that a little bit further? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. You know, you move your business to an area, you want to know you have people who can come and work for you that you don't have to train, but you also want to know that the community that you're coming to is full of people who have good jobs, who provide for their families, who can afford to purchase your products mm -hmm. or go to your restaurant uh, or you know things of that nature. So it's not necessarily just the people who want to come work for you. You want a healthy and thriving economy for the entire community to support your business. And I'd, I'd also say that workforce development, and Cassie touched on this a little bit more, but I just want to make sure people understand it's not just about getting a student ready for college. It's about getting that student ready for a trade right out of high school. And I know there's uh, a lot of demand, and I'll just use welding as an example. There, there are people, they cannot find welders today. And it doesn't make any difference whether it's here or back in my home state of Nebraska. I've got friends up there that said, we just can't find welders because mm -hmm. nobody's teaching these skills anymore. And so I think it's, the point is, this is not about secondary education, you know, college education. This is about creating something that addresses the needs of that person that, so they have the choice of, do I uh, go into building trades or do I actually go to college and study something, whether it's pharmacy or, or some other discipline? Would y'all say that it would be accurate that what you're trying to do with workforce development is to create awareness uh, for students of some of the various options that are out there and then creating alignment between the needs of the business, the needs of the community with what is also being developed here in Carville High School? I think that's right. Um, you know, a lot of these, 
you call them trades. I don't know if that's the appropriate lingo still today, but um, they, they get a bad rap. Uh, they have a bit of a PR problem. Um, you know, you think of manufacturing, and a lot of folks think of a, you know, a warehouse and people standing at a, at a line just putting one thing into another. And man, I mean, manufacturing is totally different today. Um, there are so many jobs that are now all about robotics. You know, these jobs you might think of as dirty jobs traditionally are not. Um, you know, they're very STEM related, uh, and you can make a really a good amount of money <laughs> right out of high school going into a lot of them. When you're talking, and Dave, you mentioned this earlier, about listening to your customers, listening to business leaders. What are business leaders telling you two about what are the skill sets that they're needing, that they're, that, they, that they're wanting to have available from students who are coming to apply for jobs in this community? Well, so I think uh, the ones, the people I've dialogued with, uh, and I'll, I'll just throw this out, uh, from a standpoint, we all hear about the new electronic cars coming, mm -hmm. okay? So my question, and I've asked Don Kitchens this, I said, Don, at this high school out here, are they training students how to work in the, in the industry when it goes to electronic cars? Because right now, everything's been gasoline engines. And so that is a need of your future. And how are you planting that seed out here at the high school so that they start thinking about that today? Because otherwise, they're going to get out of high school and they, they know how to do certain things in cars, but they're going to say, look, I don't have the skill to do that e-car. So I think it, we need to listen to businesses and their needs because their needs are changing. And, I, and I'll give you another example of agriculture. Um, most people, when you say agriculture, they think of a farmer and a tractor, <laughs> okay? And what uh, agriculture is today is it's everything from digital agronomy to flying drones to uh, biotechnology to plant breeding. So it's not just when we say welding, we got to expand on that so people know what that is. When we say agriculture, we got to be able to expand on that so we create greater awareness of what the opportunities are for the students. One of the skills that I've heard people talk about is something called soft skills. Now, what does that really mean? So I think when businesses say soft skills, and I think that's something that we hear across all industries, um, they're talking about communication skills, team working, um, you know, writing a memo, interview skills, you know, how to have a proper handshake and keep eye contact when you're speaking with someone, things like that, um, that are not necessarily taught uh, in a high school when you're learning math and English. Uh, I believe Pi worked with CHS though to to build a, a class around career skills that try to teach some of these um, in a classroom setting. But this soft skills is something you have to do and have to practice and have to you know, interact with someone yeah. to use them. And I would also say that that can be the differential advantage between me and you, okay? So if we both have the same backgrounds, whatever it may be, and whether it's welding or auto mechanics or whatever, but if I've got soft skills and you don't, guess who they're going to hire? They're going to hire me mm -hmm. because I know how to communicate and articulate myself and, and I listen to people and stuff like that. So I think uh, as a student, you need to think about not just the hard skills, that soft skills could be your differential advantage in getting a job versus somebody else. It's interesting. I was talking to a client the other day who actually had a background in the Army. And uh, we were talking about this conversation and she said, well, do you know where the term soft skills came from? And I said, no. She said, well, it actually came in 1972 as a training program in the U.S. Army. Really? That anything that was connected with a tank or equipment was a hard skill. Mm -hmm. And everything else was a soft skill. And, uh, and so it's really, uh, it's evolved and as you move forward. But that's, uh, it is interesting because you think about those basic skill set, you know, shaking hands, making eye contact, showing up on time, right. then uh, in many cases, these are incredibly important in terms of both getting and keeping a job. Mm -hmm. So you talked about the transition from helping build Collierville High School to really helping as we really evolve Collierville to, be, to become this incredible place as we move forward as a world-class center for our students. What has been the biggest challenge for Pi over the course of the past year or so in dealing with the pandemic dealing with all the challenges of the business and helping this organization move forward on its 
mission? Well, for me, I think, you know, we talked about um, communicating and interacting with folks, and I think that's hugely important in any business, but especially one like Pi, where we're saying we are connecting the business community to the schools. When you can't be in person, it's a little harder to make that connection with um, the school and especially students. So like everyone, we've been trying to, um, you know, pivot a little bit and figure out ways to do things virtually. Um, we've had virtual meetings. Luckily, we just recently had um, a large in-person meeting thanks to um, you know, the vaccine and some other things starting to line up a little bit around COVID. But um, you know, they say when you come up against a difficulty, a lot of the times that's when you get really creative and you figure out new ways to do something. And um, you know, one conversation that came out of a recent meeting is, um, you know, with COVID, it's been harder to get together. How would we connect businesses to students in the high school? And um, someone said, why don't we, you know, everyone's using Zoom. Why don't we use Zoom with some of our um, classrooms? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a class called Virtual Enterprise International here. And students actually build a business virtually. And they run different departments. And they do a lot of interesting things. And part of that is they have to actually interview for those jobs within the school and um, they always like to bring in folks from the business community to help with those interviews to help with those soft skills to get those that practice while you're in school before you get out there in the real world but a lot of these folks you know don't have time to come all the way to the school and sit through multiple interviews because you know these are busy people they're running businesses but they said hey why don't we everyone uses zoom now why don't we do zoom interviews with the students it really uh, takes a lot of the time commitment down um, for people in business. It is, they're able to do multiple of them. They can tech, connect with multiple students. And uh, you know, they're learning a new skill. I know a lot of friends that I know have to do interviews now over Zoom. So um, it's actually some good things have come out of it. They always say how necessity is the mother of invention. Yes. Right. And so that's a great one. Well, you talked about local businesses. What are the ways that local businesses can engage with students and the school districts? Well, I think there are a lot of ways. There are the ones that you would obviously think of, um, you know, internships, job shadowing. Uh, people from the business community can come in and speak to classes and, um, you know, help with specific projects around something in your industry. But um, there are some more creative ways uh, that you can think of too. I, you're actually a Pi partner, David, and. Yeah. Um, when you decided to do the show, uh, we decided to film here. We are at the high school right now. It's and uh, right now behind the camera and the production team are CHS students. So yep. we are uh, sitting in workforce development right now. That's happening live. Um, and, um, and they're so doing a great job. And they're doing they're an amazing, amazing. job. <laughs> so uh, I think we can really get creative with folks. Um, this is something that we might not have thought of before, but I love this idea. It's such a great experience. Are y'all having a good experience? Yes, they all say yes. Um, so I think the possibilities are really endless. Um, if you know the folks from the business community have the time and are willing to make the effort, I think the students are always ready to jump in and um, try some new things. I, I, I can't. I agree with you 100% on that because I think it's very critical that uh, that our businesses can sit down and whether they're internships, whether it's speaking in a class, it's about building the knowledge in that student of here's what I need, mm -hmm. whether it's today or five years from now, this is what I need. And so I, I think that interaction between businesses and students and businesses and the teachers can can only, the more we interact, and the more we share communications with each other and ideas, the greater this thing's gonna be. So what you're telling me is that it's not just the big business, not just the large businesses out there, but really small business can have an impact in, in their relationships with Pi and in, in, in this type of partnership as well. Is that correct? Yeah, and, and I'll give you a great example, David. Uh, <clears throat> you know, when we think about the automotive world, uh, we think about Landers as an example, but uh, two weeks ago when we had our uh, session out here between businesses and the instructors, uh, Jimmy Turner with Christian Brothers came out because he, I'd talked to him about it and he said, Dave, I've got needs also. And he's not nearly the size that Landers Ford is, but it shows you that small businesses have just as much applicability to what's going on here as a large business. 
Now, you just talked about this meeting that, that happened out here recently. Um, and tell me a little bit about that. I understand it was an opportunity for leaders to give feedback to those career and technical education instructors. Tell me a little bit about some of the takeaways that y'all had from this gathering. Well, I'll just talk over that kind of the high level and if you want to get into some of the specifics. because uh, So what we did was we had uh, about 12 different breakout sessions uh, where we had, whether it was pharmacy, whether it was automotive or welding or IT, uh, we had about 12 different sessions where we had the instructors sitting at the table and we invited businesses uh, to sit at that same table and start that dialogue. And, and it goes back to um, my comments earlier that said, the business is the customer, you're the engineer and the scientist creating the product for him. Mm -hmm. So you, how do you know you're meeting each other's needs? And, and so that was the first step. And uh, so we had about a, I'm gonna say an hour dialogue between the teachers and the instructors, or teachers in the, in the businesses. And then we went around the room uh, and we said, okay, what did you learn at this table? So one table said, well, we learned this, but yet another table heard what they learned and so they gained experiences from that, ex uh, what that first table said, and then the second table would say something different. And so it was a good way for us to uh, show that there's all kinds of opportunities. And then we did a survey, and I'll let Cassie talk a little bit about the survey at the end. Sure. I think a couple interesting things we learned from the survey. One of them was that um, as far as the businesses go that were there, I think about two-thirds said they had never had the opportunity to give feedback um, to a, a wow. school or a teacher. Uh, whether that, you know, it probably means they didn't really know how to make that happen. Mm -hmm. um, but another interesting thing is that 100% uh, said that they made a connection with the teacher and found a way that they would be able to um, do an internship or a job shadow or some of that work-based learning that we talked about, which I thought was great. Um, and all of the teachers and all of the educators were there. I think they each rated the meeting about a nine and a half out of 10. Um, and they all said that they would be interested in doing it again, which I think is great and um, showing that interest on both sides. Uh, I think that shows kind of why Pi is an important factor here because you have these folks in the business community who loved this meeting, who got a lot out of it, who want to do it again, the teachers who felt the same, but this was really the first meeting of this nature that we had on this level. And that shows us that all we really needed was a, a bridge or a facilitator to come in and make this happen. And we intend to build keep coming this. back and yeah, building on this. Yeah, I think David, the other comment that struck me was, uh, we asked for any written comments and we had several people say, I sat here for two hours, but it wasn't enough time. I need, should have, I would like to have sat here for more than just two hours sharing ideas and thoughts with these instructors. And so it, it was a great meeting. And, and I would tell you that uh, everybody that's listening to this, that um, Roger Jones, who's the principal uh, out here at the high school, he started the program out by saying, this is the only school that's trying something like this in West Tennessee. They're in, you know, you can go to any other school in Memphis or Houston or Germantown, uh, Covington, Jackson. There isn't anybody that has tried this except for Collierville. So we're on the, we're on the cutting edge of something here that's unique that uh, we just need to figure out how to make it better. Let me give you all some feedback because I was on the phone with a, a representative from the State Department of Education. And, uh, and they were talking about how, what is going on in Collierville? between Collierville High School and Pi is something that they're seeing as both a state and national model uh, that everyone's trying to catch up to what you guys are doing, what Collierville High School is doing. So keep up the good work. And uh, Cassie, you talked about one of your three words being a connector. And uh, that's exactly the type of connection that we need. So good first step. What do we see as the next steps to follow up that meeting? Well, I think considering that we asked for two hours of folks' time and we were worried that that was gonna to be too much and we heard that that was in fact not enough time <laughs> for everyone to have the conversations that they want. Um, I think we're gonna look at having working groups around the different CTE programs where it won't be a large group where we bring in everybody from the business community to sit down at tables. We focus on welding or we focus on automotive or we focus on nursing and have those small working groups that can get together, spend more time 
meet with more frequency to really make sure that um, what's being taught lines up with uh, local industry business needs and um, build on those partnerships that way. Yeah, and, and I would say the same thing that uh, we just need to uh, reconnect with the instructors in the business because the question, and Cassie and I have talked about this, what is that next step? Is the teacher going to take the lead and reach or is the business going to take the mm -hmm. and lead? And we need to be, uh, PI needs to be the catalyst to make sure that second meeting occurs. Right. And, and so Cassie and I, we've talked about what is that next step on doing this? Is it another meeting in June where you just get three different industries that are not even aligned like automotive and agriculture and pharmacy, you know, so you can have a breakout. But, but PI's role has got to be, we got to be the catalyst to keep this thing going. Then I'd, I'd go back to another comment that you made, Dave, uh, when you were referencing uh, the state of Tennessee is recognizing what's unique here. Here's what I would, I always have a lot of sports analogies, but I would, I would tell you that uh, everybody likes to be on a winning team, okay? Pi is doing something with the school system here that is totally unique, that's going to be groundbreaking and I would encourage people in the town of Collierville, if you have a business, to get engaged with PI, become a member of PI, because it's going to be the winning program as we look forward, just like your comments about what the state's saying. So join, join the team. Okay, you're talking about these industry subgroups. Then I'm sure that if a business did not have the opportunity to attend that first meeting, that there's still an open opportunity for them to come and get involved. Yeah, um, I think the beautiful thing about us trying to really re reinvigorate PI and build this amazing partnership with the school district is that PI isn't, you know, just this this organization and the business community is here. The business community is PI, and PI is the business community. So whatever it is that they're looking for and they're wanting to do as far as workforce development and partnerships, that's what we're going to be aiming to do. So as we get more people to join us, they're really going to help kind of steer the direction of PI and where we're going. You know, we're, we're, we're really helping them help themselves. There you go. Exactly. So that's great. Now you talked an awful lot, and we've talked an awful lot about Collierville High School, but is the work of PI limited only to the high school level? It, it is not. And Cassie mentioned this a little bit earlier. Uh, it all starts at the lower grade level. And I told you I like sports analogy, so I'm going to give you another one. Uh, if Carville wanted to have a championship football team, win the state title in, in football, and have a bunch of athletes go on and play Division One college football, whether it's at Tennessee or Ole Miss or Alabama, wherever it may be, uh, here's the question you got to ask yourself: Do you expose those potential football players to football for the first time? when they get to ninth grade? No. The answer is no. If you want a championship football team, you got to start it down in that fifth, fifth grade, sixth grade, so you understand uh, what football is about, you understand the skills it's going to take, you understand all that, and that becomes the feeder program sure. into the high school. So um, it's very critical that as we talk to businesses that we say, just don't worry about the kids coming out of high school. What can you do to create interest at that, at that younger level? Because that's where the seed starts and starts to grow right there. And if you haven't uh, let that student understand what the opportunity is in that fifth, sixth, seventh grade, they may not have any interest because they think they already know what they want to do when they get to ninth grade. Perfect. Yep. Cassie? Um, I would just add, uh, going back to the soft skills, I think practicing soft skills before high school um, will help immensely. I think it just helps um, students that know how to do some of those things. I know there are programs like there's one called The Great Shake that starts I think fourth, fifth grade where we have business people coming into schools and helping students with eye contact and handshakes mm -hmm. and learning how to dress professionally. Maybe and, even negotiating for a better grade. Oh, there yeah. you go, yeah. <laughs> and just learning those things um, at a young age just make them feel much more natural. Um, instead of trying to, to scramble and learn them at 17, 18 when you're starting sure. to think about um, job interviews. So Cassie, how would a, a local business get involved with PI? What would be the process? Um, it's pretty easy. You can go on our website and find my contact information um, and just reach out to myself 
reach out to Dave yep. if you know someone who's a pie partner already. Um, they could certainly connect you. Um, it's, um, it's just as simple as filling out a form and um, getting connected with us and we'll start the ball rolling. You know, because we are here at Collierville High School and because we have these great kids here, part of what we try to do with this show is also bring in fantastic people like yourselves who also can share a little bit of, of your lessons and some of the things you've learned. What would y'all say are the most important attributes that someone can have to be a successful leader? Well, I think one of the most important ones is being a, a great communicator. And when I say a great communicator, it's not just about me talking to you. It's about me listening to what you want. And, and great leaders uh, listen to people and then they, that helps them form what they think they need to be doing to make that organization better. So I think communication skills, and it goes back to soft skills, uh, communication is very critical. Cassie, you get the last word. I would say that being okay with being flexible and creative um, when you come to a problem, and also not accepting something just because it's the way it's always been done. Um, I think we do that a lot. We come up against a barrier and we think, well, you know, this is, we've always done it this way and we, we have to keep, you know, down this path. And I think that's not always true. I think um, barriers stop people and they're only barriers because people think and accept that they are. Mm -hmm. And I think being willing to push through that and say, how can we make this change to make, you know, our product or ourselves a little better. Um, so just keeping your mind open and uh, being a creative thinker, I think, is important. You know, uh, as we, we close out this, this session, uh, Dave, you kept talking about the things that you're doing at this program. And you talked about your sports analogy, and I kept harking back to one of my favorites, and that is, if you build it, they will come. Exactly. And it sounds like that's really what you guys are doing in workforce development, is you're helping build something that really can enhance the future of our community, for our students, for businesses, you know, for everyone associated with Collierville. Well, yeah, and we're just at the step, we're just at the starting line right now. I, you know, there's only up, we can only go up on this thing. And so um, I want everybody to be excited about this. I, I want everybody to see the opportunity that this creates, not only for your business, but for the town of Collierville uh, and the students of Collierville. Uh, we're on to something here that nobody else is doing. And sure, we'll hit a few speed bumps, and we may not be right 100% of the time, mm -hmm. but it, it's from those mistakes you get better. And, and so that's why I think what we're doing with the pie has only got upside as we go forward. Well, fantastic. Well, again, both of you, thank you so very much for what you're doing, what you're doing with pie, what you're doing for the students at Collierville High School, and really for everyone within the Collierville community. Uh, I really feel that you are onto something, and this is something that will really benefit all of us. So thank you for being our guest today, and thank you again for, for what you're doing for the future of our community. Thanks well, thank for you having very it. much. It's been a pleasure to be here. The American futurist and author, R. Buckminster Fuller, once said that we are called to be architects of the future, not its victims. Today, we are living in a time of exponential and continuous change. The skills needed to succeed in the workforce of today and the future are constantly evolving. Curiosity, creativity, taking initiative, multidisciplinary thinking, and empathy will be critical components of the skill sets required for success in the workplace of tomorrow. The manner in which we prepare our students for this future must also change. 69% of the most in-demand jobs that will be created over the next 10 years will not require a traditional four-year degree, but they will require advanced training and certifications. A commitment to workforce development will be essential in preparing our children for our future. We are not just preparing for college and career, but for commitment to lifelong learning and living lives of purpose. The highest reward of a person's toil is not what they get for it, but what they become by it. And that is my two cents. We invite you to join us next month as we sit down with Lisa Plath, Library Director for the Lucius E. and LCC Birch Junior Library here in Collierville. 
In the show, we will discuss the new Story Walk installation at Halley Park Lake and how this unique initiative encourages reading, outdoor activities, and family bonding. We will also discuss Collierville's library and how it promotes literacy in our community through various programs and events. Don't miss this engaging look at how our library is paving the way through interactive initiatives. Until next time, I'm your host, David Pickler. Thank you for watching Bull TV, where together we deliver solutions for a stronger community.